Rocio Wanika Hornos was born on November 9, 1979. Her parents were Alicia Hornos and William Wanika. The couple had two other children and lived in the Mijas area of Costa del Sol, Spain. The marriage was troubled and violent. Due to this, Alicia started having an affair with a woman named Maria Dolores Vasquez. Up until this point, there was no prior evidence that she was a homosexual. The following year, Alicia left Willem and returned to her hometown, Holland. With the separation, Alicia and the three children moved in with Maria. The two then bought a house together. Although Maria was named as sole owner, the following year, the divorce with Willem was finalized and Alicia was given full custody of the children. At the time, little Rocio was happy with her new family life. She and her sister Rose were proud of their two mothers. The girls also wrote numerous times in their personal diaries about their affection for Maria. Everything seemed to be going well, until in 1988, the relationship between Alicia and Maria began to unravel, and soon they decided to separate. Due to the house belonging to both women, they even lived together for a short time before Alicia decided to move out. Then, the friendship between the two women fell apart and they entered into a legal fight for the house. Over the years, the family became more and more financially established. They weren't rich, but had everything they need. Alicia was dating again. Her new companion treated her with love and affection, in addition to being very respectful of her children. A short time later, Rocio's brother left home to work in another city, and her sister was finishing high school, and she was getting ready to go to college. On October 9, 1999, around 5.30 p.m., Rocio, already 20 years old, said goodbye to her mother and sister, telling them that she was going to her boyfriend's house in La Cala de Mijas, which is at a distance of just 500 meters. The young woman said goodbye to her boyfriend around 9.30 p.m. The boy said he would leave her at home, but she preferred to walk and told him that when she got there, she would take a shower, change clothes, and go out to meet some friends at an amusement park in Frangiola, a neighboring municipality. Rocio then left her boyfriend's house. Strangely, this was the first time she had made the walk back to her house alone. Usually her boyfriend or mother would give her a ride, but for some reason she wanted to walk. That's when she just disappeared. When Rocio didn't come home, her mother called her boyfriend and they quickly went out to look for her. They walked around the neighborhood asking if anyone had seen Rocio and the man reported seeing the young woman walking towards her house that night. Since she had said that she was going to the amusement park with her friends and none of them answered the phone, they thought it was better to wait. The next morning, Alicia panicked when she saw that her daughter hadn't returned. She called the young woman's boyfriend again and he contacted the friend she said she would meet, but no one saw her at the amusement park. With that information, Alicia decided to take a walk with her girlfriend to clear her head. On that walk, the two retraced the same path that Rocio would have taken the night before. As they passed through a vacant lot, they spotted a pair of running shoes, the same type of shoes Rocio had been wearing the night before. As they investigated further, the women found a napkin and several blood stains all over the grounds. Afraid of what they might discover, Alicia finally decided to call the civil guard. The area was immediately cornered off, and that same day, the police, the young woman's mother, and more than 1,000 volunteers scored the area in search of Rocio. According to the detectives, there were strong indications that the young woman might not be alive anymore. Investigators noticed blood trails and tire tracks, as if a body had been dragged into a vehicle and taken elsewhere. Police also theorized that the location where the blood was found was on sloping ground, and it would be a difficult task for someone to drag the body alone. With that in mind, the police came to believe that at least two people were involved in the crime. The blood found that the scene was taken for analysis. On October 16, investigators informed family members that the blood at the crime scene actually belonged to Rocio. The forensic analysis also identified samples from another individual. Due to the large amount of blood present, the police concluded that it was most likely that Rocio had died due to the heavy bleeding. The case took over the local media and quickly spread throughout Spain. Investigators were blindsided, until a week later, a key witness came forward. 
On the night of Rocio's disappearance, around 10 p.m., a taxi driver was driving close to where the blood was found. According to him, out of nowhere, a car came towards him from the opposite direction and he had to swerve and stop. As the vehicle passed, he said he heard a high-pitched scream, as if someone was moaning in pain. The man got nervous and left. When he saw the case of the missing girl, he decided to go to the police. The investigation seemed to be heading towards a dead end, until, on the 2nd of November, more than three weeks after the disappearance, a body was found in a vacant lot near the sport club Los Altos del Rodeo, located between the municipalities of Barbella and San Pedro de Alcantara, about 50 kilometers from where the blood was found. Police found that the criminal tried to hide the young woman's body on top of some bushes and covered with branches and dry leaves. The body was without clothes and unrecognizable, which was unusual given the short exposure time. The reason for this, according to the coroners, is that due to the region being infested with carnivorous wasps, they must have stung the body several times, and the acidic corrosion of the venom of these insects resulted in a more accelerated decomposition. The state was so degraded that it was impossible to visually identify it at first. Near the corpse, the police found two garbage bags. Inside one of these bags, Rose identified the rings and a t-shirt that belonged to her sister. The t-shirt had cut marks and highlighted that the killer had taken her clothes off after the attack. With positive identification, the police were able to assume to some extent that the body was indeed Rocio's and the DNA analysis removed any doubt. It was really her. The necropsy concluded that Rocio had been attacked first and then suffered a knife attack, probably while trying to escape from the attacker. The single blow damaged several of her internal organs and would have rendered her unconscious or paralyzed. From that necropsy and subsequent examinations, it was also concluded that Rocio had been lying still for several hours, possibly alive, before the assailant decided to move her body to the place where it was found. Due to the way it was placed in the bushes, the police determined that the body was not simply dumped, but gently placed in place. And more, all of this would have happened within a few hours of the attack. The road Rocio was found on was a quiet, secluded trail that skirted the N340 highway. This led to the belief that the assassin, or assassins, knew the region well and chose it precisely because it was a place with little access. Alicia and Rocio's boyfriend reported to the police the strange man who had seen her walking towards her house the night she disappeared. And as the blood was found in an area completely opposite the street where she lived, he could have seen something. However, when he was sought by the police, his relatives informed him that this man, whose name was never released to the press, had died a few days ago. The investigation then began listening to friends, relatives and neighbors, and the police began to focus on Alicia's ex-girlfriend, Maria. Nobody knows why they did this, but it's believed that they developed a theory that Maria was extremely angry with the fact that Alicia left her and they were still fighting in court over the house they bought together. The story seemed plausible to some people. It was nothing more than a revenge and Maria took Rocio's life. Although there was no physical evidence to associate the woman with the case, she was officially accused by the authorities and sent to court to provide clarification. During the trial, the prosecutor focused on Maria's possessiveness despite not presenting any evidence. She has been described as a dominant, predatory woman. After just four hours of deliberation, without any proof or evidence linking the woman to the crime, Maria was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years imprisonment without the right to parole. Her lawyers immediately demanded a new trial and it was granted. However, while Maria was imprisoned, something happened that would lead this whole story to a surprising turn. In August 2003, Four years after the crime that killed Rocio, a 17-year-old girl named Sonia Carabantes was returning home at around 5 a.m. She said goodbye to friends who had accompanied her to a local fair and they watched from afar as Sonia walked towards the street where she lived. At the same time, a man named Tony King was lurking in a nearby alley, ready to pounce. Tony would have been seen by neighbors a few days earlier, passing in front of the young woman's house, probably plotting his crime. 
As she passed through the alley, he jumped on top of her and dragged her into a nearby tree. Tony then repeatedly hit her in the face, head and body until she was unconscious, then put her in the trunk of his car and left. The man drove for about 17 kilometers to an isolated point in Cerro Gordo, a nearby region. There, he put Sonia in the backseat of his car, where he did things to her. Later, he took her life by suffocating her and hid her between some rocks. While leaving the crime scene, Tony threw Sonia's t-shirt and pants out of the window, and the rest of her clothes he dumped in a trash can. After the body was discovered, Tony's ex-wife called the police. She already had suspicions that he was involved in Rocio's death, and this new crime only made her more certain. The man was taken in for questioning and his DNA was analyzed with blood found at the crime scene. The sample was compatible, and he was arrested and charged with a crime against Sonia. But would he also have been responsible for the crime that victimized Rocio? Tony Alexander Bromwich was born in 1967 in England, and from a very young age, he suffered abuse from his older brother, and this would have a profound impact on his adult life. Little is known about his childhood, but he is said to have lived in London into his early teens. In 1986, age 19, Tony was sentenced to 10 years in prison for trying to strangle five call girls and seriously injuring one of them. While in jail, the police discovered that Tony only committed his crimes on Mondays and Wednesdays, as he was with his fiancée on other days. It was also reported that Tony never got to consummate a relationship with the victims, as he was impotent. In 1991, with only five years of sentence, he was released from prison as he would be mentally fit to return to social life. Six months later, he was arrested again for armed robbery. Tony was sentenced to five years in prison, during which time he changed his name to Tony King. In 1996, he was released and married his fiancée, Cecilia Matilde Pantoja. She was two months pregnant at the time and gave birth to a baby girl named Sabrina. Although Tony had a family and a job, that didn't stop him from committing another crime in 1997. This time, he threatened a woman with a knife and tried to have forced intercourse with her at a train station. And although he fled the scene, CCTV footage was shown on television. The image was of poor quality, but several people claimed it was Tony King. He didn't wait to be arrested this time and fled with his family to Malaga in southern Spain and started living a new life. Six months later, police in England tracked him down. Tony was working as a real estate agent and was notified to voluntarily surrender to the police and return to the UK. However, he refused and the Spanish government was informed. But for some reason, he was considered a low-risk criminal and they felt that an extradition would not be necessary. At this time, Tony crossed his path with Rocio's mother. It turns out that Alicia had been hired as a cleaner by the same company he worked for, and he certainly saw the young woman with her mother a few times. In the year 2000, Cecilia ran away with her daughter and left Tony alone. It is believed that, at the time, Cecilia already suspected that Tony was involved in Rocio's murder, but decided not to say anything to the authorities. In 2001, he started working at a bar, where he met and became good friends with a man named Simon Bowers, who also worked at a bar. Later that same year, Simon quit his job and opened his own bar. He then invited Tony to work as a cook, waiter and security guard. Shortly after this change, the crime that killed Sonia took place and Cecilia decided that she would contact the police. Tony was arrested and blood samples proved that he was responsible for the two crimes, Rocio's and Sonia's. A friend of Tony's named Robert Graham was also arrested as an alleged accessory to the crime, but was soon released due to lack of evidence, despite the police being sure that Tony did not act alone. In 2005, Tony King was sentenced to 36 years for the crime against Sonia, and in 2006, to another 19 years for the crime against Rocio. After her arrest, Maria was released and received financial compensation from the state in the amount of 120,000 euros. However, 
Alicia always believed that Maria was somehow involved in the crime against her daughter, but nothing was ever proven. In 2008, UK police reported that Tony was a suspect in 12 other murders that took place from 1987 to 1994. However, the police later commented that this was just speculation. On December 20, 2011, Alicia went to the press and reported having received two letters, allegedly written by Tony King, in which he confesses that the crime was ordered by her ex-girlfriend, Maria Dolore Vasquez. According to Alicia, the letter is with her lawyer to prove the handwriting. In the letters, Tony tells that Maria was present with him in the vacant lot when Rosia was captured. Maria would have drawn her to the spot, and what's more, she would have had a fit of laughter when she watched the young woman beg for her life on the ground. Alicia is convinced that the letters were actually written by Tony. However, as of yet, the authenticity of these letters has yet to be proven. On November 9, 2019, 20 years after the crime, Alicia gave an interview to a Spanish TV and reaffirmed her conviction that Maria ordered the crime. In the interview, she said, My daughter didn't receive justice. There is an evil hand behind everything. It is very difficult to remember what happened to my daughter. The pain of losing a child is incomprehensible, and I suffer it all. Only the worst part is the certain that justice has not been done. As you could see, this case is a little controversial in some points and has some doubts. And you? Do you think that Maria is in fact the mastermind of the crime? Or does Alicia just want to get revenge on her ex-partner in some way? Alright folks, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes, and I see you next time.